Hello. <laughs> good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from today. Um, welcome to Engineering for Change, or E4C for short. Uh, we're pleased to bring you our uh, and this month's installment of the E4C seminar series, which is spearheaded by uh, ASME's Engineering for Global Development Research Committee, with the purpose to intellectually develop the field of engineering for global development. Uh, we host a new research institution monthly to learn about their work in advancing the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and Sustainable Development Bar Brompe. Today's seminar is presented by Dr. Amy Bilton, who is the Director of the Center for Global Engineering at the University of Toronto, and will be moderated by the EGD Research Committee Co-Chair, Jesse austin Bremerman, as well as myself. The seminar will be archived on the E4C uh, website, as well as our YouTube channel. I know a few questions have already come in regarding that. Both of the URLs are listed on the slide here. Information on upcoming seminars is available on our site, and E4C members will receive invitations to those seminars directly. If you have any questions, comments, and recommendations for future topics or speakers, please contact our team at research at engineeringforchange.org. And if you're following us on Twitter today, please join the conversation with our dedicated hashtag, hashtag E4C Seminar Series. Now, before we move on to our presenters, I'd like to tell you a bit about Engineering for Change. E4C is a knowledge organization, digital platform, and global community of over 1 million engineers, designers, development practitioners, and social scientists who are leveraging technology to solve quality of life challenges faced by underserved communities globally. Some of these may include access to clean water and sanitation, sustainable energy, improved agriculture, and more. We invite you to become a member. Membership is free and provides access to news and thought leaders, insights on hundreds of essential technologies in our solutions library, professional development resources, and current opportunities such as jobs, funding calls, fellowships, and more. Members also receive exclusive invitations to online and regional events and access to resources aligned to their interests. We invite you to visit our website to learn more and sign up. E4C's research work cuts across geographies and sectors to deliver an ecosystem view of technology for good. Original research is conducted by E4C fellows annually on behalf of our partners, sponsors, and delivered as digestible reports with implementable insights. We invite you to visit our research page, the URL is listed on this slide, to explore our field insights, research collaborations, and review the state of engineering for global development, a compilation of academic programs and institutions offering training in the sector. If you have a research question or want to work with us on a research project as a fellow, please contact us at research at engineeringforchange.org. And with that, I'm so thrilled to actually give a shout out to our latest cohort, many of whom are joining us on the seminar today. Uh, our 2020 research fellows, we have 25 fellows from across the globe. You can see on the slide here the locations of our fellows who will be working with us over the course of uh, the summer and into the fall, conducting ecosystem research, uh, collecting field insights and delivering analysis for publication online, distribution to our partners, and presenting at conference. We had over 400 interested applicants from 72 countries this year. Our cohort is over 50% comprised of women, 56% to be precise, and is truly interdisciplinary. Welcome to our fellows, those of you who are joining us today. And again, if you're interested in fellowship, please uh, look at uh, the website linked on the slide. So with that, I'd like to take a moment to, to conduct a few important housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, we'd like to practice, and some of you are already doing this, uh, using our functionality here with WebEx. Please type into the chat window what part of the world you're joining us from. The chat window is located at the bottom right of your screen. So just add your location. I see folks from Vermont, from Colombia, from Peru, from South Africa. We see you Oregon, India. Uh, Chicago, uh, let's see, I'm scrolling here, San Diego, Myanmar, Nebraska, Germany, Bavaria, it's the first time I've seen Bavaria, I think, um, Tanzania, Jordan, Appalachia, Austin, Texas, Waterloo, Ontario, Germany, Alabama, Netherlands, I'm not going to read all of these, uh, suffice it to say, Stockholm, Northern Uganda, Ecuador, Kenya. It's a very diverse audience we have today. We're so thrilled to have all of you. Uh, really excited to see the interest in this truly important topic. Um, keep, keep it up. So some of you are also uh, commenting in the, in the Q&A window. Please note, 
that the Q&A window, which is located below the chat, should be for questions for the presenter. We have a lot of attendees today, so we want to make sure that your questions are not lost. So please uh, do use the Q&A window for uh, those questions so we can aggregate them for the end. If you have any comments also for your fellow uh, attendees or just in general uh, questions that are more for admin, please use the chat window and you can send a private chat to our admin as well if you're having any troubles. Um, on that note, if you are having troubles with uh, the audio broadcast, uh, there's always uh, the traditional way of hitting stop and then start uh, or opening up a WebEx in a different browser. All right, welcome everyone. Welcome, so excited to, to have you all with us. Uh, with this, I'm going to go ahead and introduce today's presenter. Uh, Dr. Amy Bilton is, and I'm so sorry, I just made my window quite large. I'm just gonna do this. Dr. Amy Bilton is assistant professor at the in the Mechanical Engineering Department um, at the University of Toronto and the Director of the Cross Disciplinary Centre for Global Engineering. Her research group, the Water and Energy Research Lab, or WORL, focuses on developing innovative water and energy technologies which are geared towards global development. She has worked with industry and NGOs around the world, most notably in India, Bangladesh, Vietnam, Mexico, and Nicaragua. She completed her PhD and Master's in Aeronautics and Astronautics at MIT and her Bachelor's in Engineering Science, focusing on aerospace at the University of Toronto. Prior to her time at U of T, Amy has also worked as a systems engineer at Pratt Whitney Canada and Honeywell Aerospace. With that, Amy, I'm going to pass over the slides to you. Uh, All right, let me just see. I'm now going to introduce Jesse because he always uh, needs no introduction. Is is really <laughs> what the word is, but he also doesn't want me to focus too much on 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 his bio, which you can read on every single. Uh, description of every seminar we have, so I will leave it to him to do that. So with that, Amy, the slides are yours. Welcome. We're keen to hear your insights. Yeah, great. Thanks, Yana. I'm really, I'm really uh, happy to be here today. So when I when I signed up for the slot, um, it was back in probably back in January. So it was before before this whole uh, COVID situation kind of uh, came into this world picture. So. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit today about some things we've been thinking about in our research group and some things we've been de developing in our research group um, and really, you know, how we're thinking about um, how we can make some technologies in this space which can make an impact. Um, but I'm, at the end of this, I'm also going to take a little snapshot and thinking about, you know, given the fact that things have changed a little bit, some things that we might need to think about and we should think about collectively um, in this in this space in the context of COVID, which is which is uh, which is you know uh, super uh, important um, for many reasons. Um, so just to kick things off, um, sorry, I just need to click here in the right spot. Uh, you know what I'm going to talk today about uh, is really developing technology for the base of the pyramid. When we're when we're thinking about that we do in in our group. Um, a lot of the projects that we take on and we think about, uh, we're thinking about technologies that can make an impact for the very poor, the people who are making a uh, few dollars per day. But part of the challenge when you're thinking about design in this context, design for this particular vulnerable population, um, is the fact that people doing the design and a lot of the work and all the things that are being designed, is, is a lot of it is being done really for this part of the income pyramid here, which is, let's see if I can actually get this to work. Uh, maybe I can't, that's okay. Um, this, this top part of the pyramid, so 90% really of the design that work that's being done is really being done for these high income income bracket. Um, and unfortunately, the target market uh, that, that, we're, that we're thinking about, um, the very poor, they pay the highest prices uh, really for their product, for what, what they're trying to get relative to their income. And a lot of times they're getting things which are not very well suited uh, for for their needs. And why, you know, why is that? You know, um, we sit down and we think about things related to, you know, we're we're designers, um, and when we're actually doing our work, you know, we we use a process. Uh, and I'm not going to go through all the details in this process because we only have I only have about half hour today to to, to chat with you. And if, um, but we work through a design process where we think about, you know, identifying problems, defining requirements, and going through going through this iterative kind of design loop. But because of the way this design is a lot of times is done, 
there's a lot of there's a lot of issues. Sometimes there's there's technologies which have been developed and designed for that developing work world market, which is that which are then pigeonholed uh, into serving um, serving this developing world market. And a lot of times, because of the way that they were developed and designed, there's things which make them really inappropriate and make them um, things that actually don't satisfy the needs of the end market. Even sometimes when, when designers are actually developing technologies with, with the particular context in mind, they often miss some key requirements in these initial stages of the design process that makes them inappropriate. Um, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about today is really thinking about, you know, how can we understand, you know, if technologies are inappropriately designed and how can we actually rethink this initial phase of this design process so we can, so we can, uh, how we can come up with innovative solutions which can, which can potentially uh, serve this market which has very unique design constraints. I'm not going to get a chance to talk to you today, but this is something that E4C really focuses on is, you know, after technologies have been also developed, how do we get them out to market and how do we make sure that they can make an impact? Um, and, you know, E4C has a great uh, technology solutions market uh, online uh, portal um, and other, other things to be able to do that. So I'm not going to be able to focus on that today, but a lot of times as well, there's, 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 there's many technologies, great technologies that just don't make that transition uh -huh. as well. So thinking about this, you know, there's a lot of things, a lot of technology that's developed that comes up short because of the way this, this design, this design process is, is, is really implemented. Um, you know, uh, I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm going to talk a lot about water and sanitation uh, today. So in examples I'm going to show here on the left, we've got, you know, sanitation. There, sanitation is a huge, huge issue for many in the developing world. Nearly 2 billion people lack even just basic sanitation systems. And above that, um, there's, there's a billion more, uh, more than a billion more, that actually don't have, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, sorry, uh, that even for those people, that population, even if they have some sanitation solution, uh, such as this poor flush toilet, which you're seeing on the left, uh, the, the actual uh, uh, waste from the system is not, or not, it's not properly treated. So despite the fact that there's many of these, many technologies on the market which might fill this need, there's still these this conditions that are happening. So let's, we, you know, can we boil it down and can we think about that? There's many other failures we can also think about. Uh, classic, classic one and, and that we see many times in, our, in, in my work is um, when we're traveling, we'll see, we'll see broken water pumps all over the place. And this is just one statistic. Um, uh, approximately 60,000 hand pumps are installed in Sub-Saharan in Africa each year, but 66% uh, of them fall into disrepair and and are, are non-functional. So, what you know, what is what is the main what's going on here and what's causing this? Another quick case study we're gonna, I'm just going to quickly bring up here uh, of something where where technology has really come up short and is uh, is a case study of the play pump. So. People may have heard of this technology. I'm just going to give it a quick give a quick overview of, of what's going on here. It's a technology which is actually introduced at an agricultural fair back in 1989, and the concept is demonstrated on the left here. Uh, you know, here you'll have some borehole well. Uh, you'll have the idea is okay. You have children in these communities; they need some place to play. Uh, can we harness some of that energy to do something useful? The idea behind the play pump was you could have a merry-go-round. The children could play. Uh, they could pump the water that's needed for, for the local household use, uses. Uh, it can be pumped up into the top of this water tower. And then, uh, and then when, when people need it, uh, they could come and they could take some, take some water uh, from the water tower uh, and take it, take it back home. So this garnered a lot of attention back in the early 2000s. It won multiple awards, including uh, some awards from the World Bank generated huge amounts of funding, uh, six, six, over $60 million in funding. Uh, but it was seen as a major, major failure. And there's many reasons why this, this came to play and why it's a major failure. Part of it is actually just thinking about the problem and thinking about the requirements. Um, and when you actually think about this problem, uh, when you're thinking about you know, children playing, how many hours a day will children play on a merry-go-round? You know, probably minutes, right? 
when you actually look at the system and you actually go through and look at it from an engineering standpoint, it actually would take so almost 24 hours a day of the children playing to be able to get the amount of water which, which was needed for the particular communities where this where the system was deployed. There are other things which also made this a, uh, a seen as a failure. Um, and when this technology was rolled out, another thing that happened was these actually these pumps were installed in, uh, in areas where there was existing pumps, sometimes working pumps. They installed them in, the, in place of those working pumps. Um, and so if the children aren't able to pump enough to be able to get enough water for the community, what happens? It uh, ends up that, uh, you know, the people going and collecting the water would have to pump. And imagine, imagine, you know, imagine being a woman in this community going to collect water. And then instead of you arrive at the water, uh, at the water, water tank, no water, um, you have to basically turn a, mari a degrading merry-go-round to be able to get the water, which you need to be able to uh, supply for your family. And then other issues apart uh, on top of this reliability. Um, this is this is this is uh, um, many many issues in terms of development of technology when you're thinking about this case. So there's been many cases where technology has come up short, um, and as a result, there's many people in the developing world uh, who don't have uh, who lack access to water and, and sanitation. Um, and I'm going to come back to this a little bit later on uh, towards the end of my talk. Uh, but this has been, this is actually coming to a head and it actually is, is making huge impacts in the, in the current climate. Um, uh, this is a, an, an image uh, uh, from a water collection point uh, in Mumbai. Um, and in Mumbai's biggest slum, uh, about 80% of the people don't have uh, local, uh, local running water. So people will have to go and collect water from, an, from a local access point. This basically makes it impossible to do what a lot of us are doing, uh, you know, do this social distancing. Uh, they have to go and they have to stand in queues for hours to be able to get, to get water. And then also when they get back to their homes, um, you know, they have to think about, you know, when they're using this water, uh, are they gonna be using it for things like washing their hands? Uh, and there's been studies that have shown you know, the water usage is actually going more towards the priorities of, you know, drinking, uh, agriculture, uh, other things as well. So there's a lot of issues here, and I'll come back to this, and we can do a little think about this towards the end uh, of the talk today. So I'm going to talk a little bit about things that we're thinking about in my research group and to try to address some of these gaps when you're thinking about this type of, this type of engineering design to try to develop technologies which which can be appropriate and have an impact. You know, throughout this work and throughout the work that we do, uh, you know, you need to make sure you have strong partnerships and, and, and consultation with, with end users and use a human-centered approach. I'm not gonna talk about that in detail throughout the presentation today, um, but I'm gonna focus in on some of the work that we're doing in the lab uh, to try to think about really this first stage in this design process where we're thinking about, you know, how can we take a problem how can we boil it down to fundamentals um, and think about the particular problem at hand, not just necessarily adapting something which is existing and works in, in, in a different context um, if it's not the right solution. And really, uh, if that is a solution which is in place and it's not actually satisfying the needs, trying to understand what could be barriers which are currently in place to making that something which might work. So in my group, uh, we work in a wide range of areas. I'm going to focus in on some of our some of our newer projects today. Um, so we work on different aspects related to uh, water treatment, desalination, uh, hydro projects. So what I'm going to focus in, I'm going to focus in on on three three th three projects that we've been working on uh, that kind of talk a bit about these 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 places where we're trying to uh, fill this gap and really think about. Uh, technology in this context appropriately. So I'm going to talk a little bit about sanitation, a uh, case for sanitation, some of the work we've been doing in aquaculture, and then also agriculture as well. So first, first step when we're thinking about design and things that we've been thinking about is really you need to understand well, what's going on and, and what potential, um, potential gaps may exist. Uh, so I'm going to talk about 
uh, a case here that we've been thinking about in terms of sanitation. In, san in, the, in the sanitation space, there's been a lot of technologies that have been developed, and there's more that are currently being developed um, through some outstanding programs through the Gates Foundation. Foundation. Um, uh, many technologies have been developed, which are which which uh, can uh, handle both, you know, safe safe separation of a human excreta from from uh, and also uh, make it so it's uh, appropriately treated. Uh, dry toilets and other types of toilets as well, but. Um, this is still something which has not been pervasive in the developing world uh, context. Uh, a lot of uh, households, if they do have access to sanitation, uh, will have something that looks more like what you have on the right. Um, it's a which is a which is a poor flush toilet. The idea is it's it's basically what what you know the basic function is what I have in in my in my in my bathroom upstairs. But these households don't have access to running water. So what they do is they will, uh, to flush the toilet, they will uh, pour water uh, into the toilet itself. Um, so, you know, we're thinking of, when we're looking at this problem, we're trying to understand, okay, so um, why is it that these technologies, even though, uh, uh, you know, there are NGOs who will take and put these technologies and, and work with end users and put them into the field, um, why are they not necessarily being adopted? Uh, and, and why is it that most many of the sanitation solutions which you see in, in the developing world look like look like the one that's on the right? Um, so looking at that, you know, we can we can try to understand what's going on, what the, some of those gaps, what those, some of those gaps are. Um, when we're actually looking at sanitation, sanitation is an example, but we could looking at be looking at drinking water, other types of things where where different uh, improved technologies are being implemented. You know, there's, there's information out there. NGOs have data, there's census data. Um, you can go through and you can actually do surveys and, and, and other things, but they're often incomplete and outdated. So what you actually, what we actually need to understand uh, what's going on and why technologies are, are not being uh, adopted or taken up as you need, a, you need, you need, you need more. Um, and you, you need, you need both, Things you might get through surveys, and you need some quantitative data. When you're thinking about sanitation, part of the challenge is that you know people, when when NGOs do in interventions, or even when even when they're uh, even when surveys are done with end users, um, you know there's there's things where there's errors in the data uh, and biases that are coming into the data. Part of the other challenge here also is uh, you know in a lot of things when you're doing this type of design, you can do observation. You can you could sit there and you could uh, you know, see how a user inter interacts with technology. But when you're talking about a toilet, um, that's not really something that you can do. Um, so this is, in this context of global development and thinking about design, one of the research threads of what we're thinking about is uh, currently is how can we gather this data? How can we think about this data? And there's a lot more um, and how, how we can do that with, with instrumentation. So this is a, some current projects which we have on the go. I'm not gonna delve into details today, but with low cost uh, techno low cost sensors and 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 uh, data acquisition, um, we can think about now: Can we actually gather that uh, gather that um, data from the use of the technology, um, and and then um, use that as to really understand what those core gaps are, uh, and then be able to build uh, build that together with the the qualitative and quantitative data you get through surveys. Uh, to be able to build technology from the ground up. So this is something that we knew that we're thinking about um, in, in this in this particular context. So I'm going to jump into some of the projects which are uh, more developed that we have on the on the go. I'm going to talk about some of the projects we've been doing uh, in aquaculture. Uh, and this is this was a new field that I, I jumped into about uh, about it's been six years ago now, um, and it was not. It was not uh, something I knew a whole lot about before I started, but um, it's the field that I got into, and it's something where um, it's something which it, I see as being something that's hugely important. I didn't realize it before I actually got in the in the area. It's it's the world's fastest growing food sector, um, and uh, you know, in the context of, of global development, it's hugely hugely important. So in Southeast Asia, there's 18 million people that engage. Uh, in aquaculture, um, 
and you know in our we have partnerships working with people in in Vietnam and Bangladesh and and in both of those countries aquaculture accounts for more than five percent of the of the GDP most of the people who are conducting aquaculture uh, look like uh, uh, you know um, uh, look like this image in the top right. There's uh, small household, uh, 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 smallholder uh, fish farmers who will have have uh, ponds which are dug on their property, um, and they use it to raise raise fish. Um, however, these farmers lack a lot of resources, and one of the big big things which are limiting the production of 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 fish for these farmers. Um, it's actually the quality of the water which 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 uh, which is which they're using. Um, one of those big parameters for water quality is is how much oxygen oxygen need the fish need oxygen uh, to to grow it and, and develop. Um, so that leads to low productivity uh, for a lot of these farmers. In industrial fish farms, you know, when we when we were first, you know, when I first got introduced to this field, you know, we sat down and we we. Uh, studied what was going on, and industrial fish farms, you know, they'll, there's wide use of, of large aeration devices, like you see on the bottom right. Um, these are paddle, wheel, paddle wheels. They they will spin and 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 introduce oxygen into the water, um, but it's these are tend to be very much uh, out of reach for these these fish farmers, partially because they don't have access to uh, electrical infrastructure and uh, and they're expensive. So, in my research group, one thing that we when we when we think about these problems, once we've defined the problem together with partners and and talked talk to uh, talk to partners and 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 uh, uh, about the about the problem, we really start by focusing in on the fundamentals, and that's where we started on this on this project. Um, is we we looked at what was physically going on in these in this system. So this is what a f typical fish pond might look like. Um, you know what happens in these fish ponds is you end up with uh, you end up with oxygen which is generated naturally so it comes in from the air it has there's algae in the water that algae produces oxygen when the sun's shining so you end up you end up with lots of oxygen at the top and not much at the bottom so what aeration devices do it's two things uh, but one of the main functions of aeration devices is they actually circulate water um, top to bottom. Um, and they do other things as well in terms of increasing oxygen transfer from the from the atmosphere um, and other things. But uh, one of the biggest impacts really comes from the circulation. Um, so introducing this type of aeration has has you know huge impacts in terms of enabling healthier fish and and increasing the amount of fish you can grow in a particular pond and increasing yields. Um, but they're really out of it's really something which is out of out of reach for a lot of these. A lot, uh, a lot of fish farmers. So, with these fundamentals in mind, we thought, okay, so these these aeration devices, they're 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 big, they're power hungry, they're expensive, but really one of the things that can which they do, which increases dissolved oxygen the most, uh, is actually just circulating the water top to bottom. So we actually start started by boiling down to those fundamentals, um, and by understanding those fundamentals, we we really went through this design process where we thought about, okay, what can happen if we do something which is a simpler type of intervention, maybe something which would be more appro appropriate for this particular market than some of the big power hungry and expensive aeration devices, um, and, and implemented those. So we, we did some studies to understand first, can something simpler work? Um, and uh, we did some modeling uh, where we actually uh, looked at different segments of this pond and tried to understand what was happening with the dissolved oxygen. And what we found was if we did some very, even some very simple circulation in the pond, we could have, uh, we could have actually a great improvement in what was going on with, with the dissolved oxygen, which would, great, which would directly impact uh, farmers' productions and yields. So that led us to, uh, towards developing uh, a couple different uh, a couple different aeration concepts, which are which we're currently working on. I'm not going to be able to delve into too much detail on these today, um, but we've been working on uh, a few technologies. One is actually using uh, using a wind turbine. So the idea here uh, is as a vertical axis wind turbine. It captures the wind energy and then it circulates water uh, through an impeller under the water. Uh, 
And then the other, another one that we've been working on and actually have been doing, uh, uh, doing field trials with as well, uh, uses, uses solar heat. The idea behind this uh, is the sun uh, will come and will heat, uh, we will transfer heat from the sun down deep in into the water, and then we get uh, some convective circulation, some circulation that happens in the pond and circulating the water top to bottom. Um, so we've been working on the development of these concepts over the past uh, past few years. Um, uh, and just quick quick snapshot, this is the one on the left, the whirlwind, which is the wind-powered aeration. Uh, this is a simple prototype which we built together with some partners in Bangladesh. Um, and this is a, just a, a quick test over the course of three days where we actually had a 75% uh, improvement in the dissolved oxygen uh, in the, in the pond with the whirlwind versus uh, versus uh, versus uh, without. Uh, so this could this could have a great impact on on farmers' yields. Um, and we've been working, and we're actually working with some partners towards uh, towards different ends to be able to further advance and, and move this on along to be able to make it so it's something we can uh, get out to the marketplace. Um, so a few of my few of my former students have taken this uh, technology. Uh, we uh, developed a, a, a startup company called, uh, called Tech, and these are just a few pictures from this past year. Um, this image on the left is actually an image from uh, the ASME uh, iShow, uh, where where the whirlwind was uh, was uh, one of the one of the three winners of the ASME uh, iShow uh, last year, um, and then. Uh, subsequently, the team also uh, participated in uh, something called the Aquaculture Innovation Challenge, and we were able to raise some more funds to be able to, to take the technology uh, and advance the technology. Uh, the team has been working, uh, was working towards some, some uh, working towards building up some partnerships and, and doing some more uh, design work. Uh, we've also been working towards a partnership uh, with World Fish to be able to actually do a lar larger scale uh, RCT of the of the technology with them in Bangladesh. Uh, those plans are are on pause just for the current moment because of some of the uh, climate. But uh, this is an example of uh, you know something where in the design process we started with uh, this this uh, problem really boiled it down to fundamentals and by starting with something which uh, understanding the fundamentals we came up with something which is more appropriate. Uh, for this particular market, uh, and then and then built it up from there. Uh, so I'm going to quickly overview one other example of of uh, this type of this type of work and this type of approach that we've been taking. And this is something uh, some work which is ongoing, uh, which is actually uh, thinking about sustainable irrigation uh, for uh, uh, sustainable irrigation. So in in agriculture. Uh, a lot of the irrigation which is done in the developing world and has been done uh, uses uh, flood irrigation. You know, the idea is uh, you just uh, will um, flood a portion of land, let the waters seep in. Uh, it's hugely inefficient. Uh, you know, lots of water is lost in the process. Um, there's been a lot of work and a lot of people and some of our NGO partners uh, were working towards something that's more sustainable. So they've been working towards uh, working together with farmers, local farmers, to be able to uh, develop and, and supply uh, locally sourced uh, irrigation irrigation kits, which use drip irrigation. In some of our discussion with our partners, when we were actually doing our doing our work, what we found was there was a there was a challenge for a lot of these farmers. There, uh, you know, this is uh, that they found was um, even though they had access to uh, this drip irrigation system. There was still uh, a lot of things they were unsure of. Um, they were unsure in terms of if they were watering enough, uh, were they watering too much? Uh, and this is part of their concerns, partially because for for the farmers to be able to extract the water from the ground, it's you know it's it's hugely costly um, and, and and intensive. So they there was a need from the farmers to understand. Uh, how can we make sure that we're irrigating our land appropriately? And you know, are we doing, are we irrigating enough? So with this in mind, uh, you know, we sat down and, and again, what we did in, in our group is we started and we 
we boiled it down to really the fundamentals of what goes on. You know, what goes on in the actual soil when, when, when it's watered uh, and what happens there. So we, we started with really this fundamental, you know, when you're looking at soil, um, what happens, you know, a plant has roots in the soil and it actually has to draw the water out of the soil and it has to do this against, against, uh, against, you know, a, what's called the soil water potential, which it, basically it's this uh, negative pressure that is exerted and the plants need to draw the water, draw the water out of the soil. Um, so the fact of the matter is that this, the fact that you have this water in the soil creates this, this, a negative pressure the plants need to pull against. We thought about, could we actually take this property and again, be able to exploit this to be able to create some sort of sustainable and appropriate irrigation technology. So with that in mind, we kind of broke it down into thinking about, you know, for these, for this particular end market and through consultation with our partners, you know, they didn't want something which would rely on electricity. I didn't need very many tools um, and would be something which would be appropriate for the experience of the, of the farmers. Uh, and we ended up developing, and I can't go into all the, all the details on the design uh, today, but the idea behind this is, is actually it's a porous ceramic tip, which is inserted down into the soil. And then similar to, similar to uh, plants, uh, uh, if, as the soil dries, it actually will, ex if we have water in this water column, it'll exert a negative pressure. Um, and then what we can do is actually, we can use that negative pressure to open and close a valve and regulate and then regulate the amount of water which is put into the, to the field and do it in a completely passive, uh, completely, completely passive way. Um, so with, we ended up, uh, you know, developing and, and I can't go into all the details, developing this, this concept. And throughout the process, uh, part of our, our, our goal is, again was to make it something which would be accessible for the population. And I, unfortunately, just because of the time constraints and, and uh, and some of the technical constraints, um, you know, as part of the work that we did in, in, in as we went through, we we, re we ran we ran a number of uh, of work sessions with the with our with our with our partners, um, where we actually uh, went down and, and through some simple you know five minute session, kind of showed them how they could actually put this together, you know, uh, you know, using using some some very simple kit of parts, and they were able to do so in just a few minutes. Um, I can't show that video right now. Uh -huh. This is a quite a promising, promising concept, promising technology. Uh, we've been able to do some uh, operation, and you know, again, this is something where we're we're planning to towards some larger scale, uh, larger scale tests. You know, right now we're doing some smaller scale tests uh, here in Toronto, and it looks like this summer because of because of some of the constraints that are in place, we'll continue to do these types of smaller scale tests. Um, this is just a quick, simple kind of plot showing some of the operation of the, of the valve. You can see the pressure in the soil go down. Uh, the valve will open up, flow will go into the field, the soil wets and it closes itself back up again. Uh, and, and basically being able to regulate, regulate uh, the water, water content in the soil. Uh, so we're currently working through some, some tests in Toronto. Well, and hopefully, and uh, we've uh, done some estimation in terms of what what this would be over what some standard, what this might save over some standard practices, which farmers farmers currently use for irrigation in this context. One of the one of the things that the farmers, when we surveyed, uh, you know, how they were using these types of drip irrigation systems, they usually use some standard, you know, timed irrigation. Um, so we have plans to actually go through and do some implementation oops, um, with some of our partners uh, here in Toronto just to do some of this te these testing in the short term. Uh, on on a, on a on a little bit on a larger plot of land, and what we found is, you know, with with the controller versus what this kind of standard might be, there's a potential for actually great savings. You know, saving 75% uh, water usage or maybe more, uh, you know, over over what would be the standard kind of practices. Uh, this, of course, is variable depending on your, you know, depending on rainfall and other things as well. Uh, this is just a few examples of how we're trying to rethink some of these problems and 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 uh, really in, in thinking about water in this particular context. Really, when in, in my group, a lot of things that we're thinking about is, you know, when we're actually identifying the problem and thinking about the problem, there are a lot of things which are missed and things which 
which uh, really understanding how current technologies work. There's a lot of gaps there. Uh, and if we miss those things, we're setting, setting things up for failure. Uh, so again, you know, we're looking at how can we, how can we actually gather information and, and implement, uh, implement um, sensing approaches to be able to understand that. And then the other thing that we're really looking to do is really when we're actually going through this initial stages in this, in this design process, you know, after we've defined those requirements with our partners is can we actually boil it down uh, and really focus in based on the fundamentals and see based on those fundamentals, can we think about something which would be more appropriate in this context than just adapting something which has been used for the developed world market uh, and be able to take that kind of different approach based on those fundamentals. Uh, so just a few kind of things, you know, that's a lot of what we've been thinking about in my research group. Um, just a th few things that I've been thinking about more recently and hearing a lot about uh, and, you know, something that maybe there would be some questions about or people, uh, people might have, you know, some thoughts on, I'd be interested to hear, um, you know, lack of, lack of clean water and sanitation has been a huge issue in the fighting, fighting COVID-19. Um, as I mentioned before, this is a problem when you're thinking about basic sanitation, basic uh, hygiene, uh, even, you know, those vulnerable populations, just because of the fact that they don't have access to water, you know, it puts them at additional risk because they're not able to social distance the way that we currently are. Um, and this impacts are being seen everywhere. Unfortunately, I don't have data on, on, on a lot of the places where, where this is, at, and, uh, where this, these challenges are currently being seen, um, but, I was actually just listening to NPR uh, yesterday, uh, up first on NPR, um, and even even within North America, um, these challenges are are there. Uh, and an instance is just thinking about uh, in the southwestern United States, the Navajo Nation. Thirty percent of the Navajo Nation does not have running water. Um, in the Navajo Nation, uh, there is a higher incidence rate of coronavirus there, higher than any of the other states in the U.S. Um, and they actually have instituted a lockdown there. Uh, for those people that don't have piped water, what, what happens to them right now? They're basically just drawing water, trying to make decisions based on the water they have in their water tank, or they're violating the lockdown orders to go collect water. Um, so this, this is a huge issue, and impacts are being seen not, not only internationally, but, um, but locally as well. So what does this mean? And this is a lot of things that I've been reading about and thinking about um, what people can do and what's being done by some of the aid agencies thinking about COVID-19. Uh, you know, they're really working in this water space, trying to understand and can they do rapid deployment of infrastructure for hand washing? Um, what else can we do? You know, when I've been thinking about this, you know, there's really a need and this really kind of comes back to some of the things that I've been thinking more for more broad about more broadly is there's really a need um, in a lot of these communities to think about distributed water supply infrastructure. Um, so it's something which can enable uh, enable uh, uh, affordable distribution of water in these communities. And some of the NGOs that we've been talking to have been thinking about thinking about different ways that can be done with rainwater harvesting, and other things as well. Uh, and outside even just people who have, some people who have piped water access, you know, COVID-19 is also influencing them. You know, there's uh, many in the world that live on, inter 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 on an intermittent water supply. Um, so they're not able to actually wash their hands, uh, continue, you know, and, and uh, uh, maybe when they, when they want to as well. So another thing which can um, potentially limit the spread of COVID-19 would be some different things to be able to move towards some more continuous water supply for some of those. Some of those, um, some of those uh, areas, and some of the things that this is maybe the other things that I've just been thinking about, um, and and I flip flop back and forth between between thinking yes and no towards towards this, is that you know, and, and I'm interested if anyone else has any thoughts, you know, when all this is said and done, settled, said and done, do you think that maybe we'll move this will this move us closer towards being able to provide clean water and sanitation to, for all? Uh, you know, the optimistic side of me says, you know, maybe, you know, maybe some of the things which are being done for COVID may, may be able to do that, but it's my, you know, uh, pessimistic side of me also thinks that, you know, some of these will be just piecemeal efforts, which will not be something which is going to be, 
uh, sustainable in the, in the long term. Uh, so that, that's the last kind of big piece of the presentation. A few things I just want to plug uh, uh, as well before we kind of go into questions. Um, so something I do outside of my research group and other things that, you know, as a professor is I, I'm uh, one of the editors of development engineering. And for people who are working in this space of doing engineering for global development, this is an excellent uh, uh, place where you can actually think about disseminating some of your work. It's a, it's a place where, where we, we value, uh, value papers, which, uh, which take that picture of real on the ground kind of experience and, and how, how people have made technologies, you know, really, really work and other things that you might, other, other topics which, which might not fit in other types of journals. So if you're working in this area and you're thinking about where might be a great place for me to disseminate my work, I urge you to think about development engineering. It would be a, it's a, we're, we're always looking for good contributions and Jesse has been, has been, has been, has contributed some work to development engineering in the, uh, in the past. Um, and one last thing, I just want to say, uh, say thanks uh, to uh, you know all the people and, and sponsors who uh, enable some of the work that we do. Uh, I just came off maternity leave recently, so I realized last night when I was finalizing my slide, I don't have I don't have the most up to date picture of my group. So this is a small subset of my group, uh, uh, but uh, uh, really what I I do I I I don't do the heavy lifting. It's it's the students that do all the heavy lifting, and it wouldn't be. Uh, the work that we do wouldn't happen without 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 my team and without the uh, the, the support of the uh, for the research funding. Um, so with that, I will pass it I will pass it off to Jesse, and he may have some uh, comments or questions. Uh, I haven't written down a lot of questions. No, no, I have so many questions, Amy. This is great stuff. Um, you know, I'm going to echo what a bunch of people have said in the chat already, which is uh, it's really inspiring to see the type of application of engineering. I think the reason we're all here is we're interested in contributing and having an impact on society and your focus on, you know, using engineering, understanding those physics and, and context fundamentals to then drive solutions, which we think will or potentially have an impact, um, you know, is really inspiring and, and I think is, is you know, one, obviously one of the reasons we asked you to speak today, but I, I think, uh, you know, really highlighted the potential for engineering to make positive change, which I think is, you know, engineering for change. That's the name of what we're, what we're doing today, right? So it's, it's great to see that in practice. Um, I did have some questions. I'm going to try and, and sort of synthesize what some of the people have been saying in the chat. Yana, do you have anything you want to say before I get into that? No? Nope, okay. just uh, please continue adding your questions. All right, great. So one of the things that um, I would like to, to ask and has been asked in sort of some of the chats and, and a lot locally also a lot of questions on this is this tension between sort of systemic or structural gaps and some of the individual user human-centered problems that you discussed, right? So, you know, you're talking about, okay, aquaculture, we have aquaculture, we're good. we want to understand why why does it do the current solution not work for these farmers, you know, these, these aquacolor aqua, fish farmers in, in Thailand or Vietnam, wherever. Um, but there's some tension and that you've been bringing up between other uses for water, maybe large business is using it for other reasons or large agriculture, or there's these systemic issues where technology may not be an issue, uh, may not, may not be an impactful solution. Right. So I think the question that many of them brought up is, how do you balance and identify projects where technology might be a good solution, or how do you incorporate in your design these sort of larger systemic issues, right, with sanitation, with water, and all the projects you mentioned? Yeah, yes, yeah, it's, 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 it's a great, it's a great, um, it's a great uh, question for sure. I think it's something that we think about a lot when, we're, when I'm defining projects for for my students and working with my students to define projects. Um, you know, I think. Uh, there's a lot of very important work uh, that is being done thinking about, you know, some of these more systemic and structural, you know, gaps and thinking about policy, you know, around addressing some of these systemic and structural gaps. Um, in my group, you know, the work that we do, and we actually directly, you know, when we're thinking about and choosing our projects, um, we don't, we don't have, we don't, 
we, we have some people we know who think about those types of problems, but it's not something that's really the focus of, you know, what, what we do in, in our group. So what we try to do is we actually start a lot of times with the, you know, with the end user kind of approach and thinking about most smaller scale kind of interventions that could potentially be scaled to make larger impacts. Um, and and uh, so that, you know, we have those barriers which may exist because of the systemic and structural kind of, um, uh, uh, those structural gaps aren't something which are going to impede some of the things that we're, we're doing. So I think, you know, how we try to approach it is, you know, we start, we start with something kind of small scale user centered and where we understand at least for some working with those partners that this is a problem where we can make some implement, we can make some, where we can make some impact. Um, but at the same time, when we're selecting those problems with those partners, we think about, is it something that, can potentially be scaled and applied more broadly than, than, than with those particular partners. So I think we start with that user-centered approach, um, but I agree with you that there's a lot of, there's a lot of things related to sustainable development where it's, you know, there's a lot of systemic things which, which, which limit it. Um, we're trying to be, in our, in our own work, we try to be strategic, starting with that user-centered approach to be able to and pick out things where we think, you know, we, we have the expertise and with some of our partners we can we can look at and, and try to address. Yeah, thank you. So well, allow me to follow up and, and, and try and combine a couple of the other questions, which we're talking about the trajectory of these projects and you're touching on it now and sort of describing like we start here, then we move here, and then we move here, depending on the results that we're getting. Yeah. Um, I think a, a lot of people are asking about, you know, how do you, so you mentioned, you know, we have these partnerships, developing that partnership, but also, uh, you know, people are asking, guide me. I want to work on these types of issues, right? I'm in this location. I'm in a university. I'm in a company. What is this model that you are using? And it seems pretty similar across the projects, right? Sort of you have a style of how you envision a project developing from like initial contact with a partner or whatever, defining the problem, moving through to initial project, scaling, what, however it goes. Um, what, what do you see as those steps if you were going to talk to someone, let's say me, I'm trying to be you, right? And, and you're saying, that's what you take with these projects, right? So, um, so I think, yeah, the first, the first step is really, you know, as I mentioned, it's really kind of trying to find that problem and, and be able to really understand the full context of that problem. And really, we're not able to do that. First, to be able to do that is we need to have partners who are working in that area as, as essential kind of aspects for us to even think about, is this a problem we're going to, we're going to tackle or we're going to think about tackling. Um, so really that first essential step is, you know, finding those partners, building up that, those partnerships. That's something which is, uh, it's a really painstaking, slow and, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, process, which, which, um, which, it's uh, you need to you need to have some um, some infrastructure behind you to help help kind of support. Uh, I'm really fortunate, you know, at the University of Toronto. Um, so I'm the director of this cross disciplinary center called the Center for Global Engineering. Um, and every you know every few every few years, you know, we will come forward with a group of faculty who are you know have found some particular challenge, uh, and we're able to usually leverage that to be able to secure some funding. Uh, at least strategic funding um, through through the faculty. Um, uh, uh, there's a there's an initial kind of seed fund, and I think and that enables us usually to to get uh, to get a few to get a research associate to work with us, and and uh, and then we we start you know who can really focus on the partnership development for this particular challenge. Um, so really, we start with you know we have we have particular topics. We bring some faculty together. Um, we're able to we're able to get some initial kind of seed funding but from from the from the university to help support you know this is we think this is an important area where we should be contributing. Um, we get the we get the, the university to kind of uh, back us and and then we we kind of get some we get um, we get a research associate to to work with us and he helps to kind of orchestrate and put together a lot of those partnerships. Um, so I think uh, you know this is a long-winded way to say like the first step is really developing those partnerships. Uh, and then understanding the problem, um, okay. and then and then and then we build and snowball from there. Without 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 uh, without those partnerships, we wouldn't get anywhere. Um, yeah, sorry. Sure. Um, 
Let me ask, uh, as there's a, so there's two other questions, but we're almost out of time. So I'm just going to ask one last one, which is, there was a lot of technical questions around like, okay, like how much wind should you have in order to really produce the aeration? And one of the things that um, I'm going to ask you, maybe it's more of a comment. It seems like you're really focused on developing this sort of engineering knowledge and maybe market knowledge around uh, the problem itself, like the, when you talk about the fundamentals, where you say, hey, you know, people understand aeration of fish farms, but no one's looked at fish farms maybe at this scale or looked at this physics fundamental because they have these other solutions available that are, you know, with the capital that they have, right? So, yeah. you know, I think you know, you, you showed a lot of graphs and a lot of sort of quantification and data gathering and really building that understanding of what really goes on in sanitation, right? Like we can't observe you, these reports, there's not a lot of data here for these markets, right? Um, so maybe you could talk about in terms of your contribution as an academic researcher within water and sanitation, right? Like you're in engineering, you're producing these papers. What is it that you're really, where do you see we need new information. Like if you wanted somebody else to work on this problem, right? Would it be like, we need to develop new technologies or are there things that you're saying, hey, we need new engineering tools or methods? Like what is, what is lacking to really take this to the next level? Like, like, are we just not doing engineering? One of the questions was, do we have incentives? Do we just need to change the incentives for companies to work in these areas and then it'll solve the problems? Or is it that, you know, even if companies wanted to work, in these areas, they may not be able to solve. What's sort of your experience when working on this problem? Is there a distinction for you? Okay, so I guess the qu the question is, you know, how do, how do we how do we make how do we get how do we get some like uh, uh, kind of some scalability of of people thinking about problems in this kind of in these kind of application domains, like more yeah. more people kind of working in these kind of application domains. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think uh, so. I think this is this is a lot of the, the things that, um, and I think I think there are some organizations out there that kind of that kind of get it and try to and understand some of the the core challenges there. Is that you know there's a lot there's a lot of issues and there's a lot of issues in this in this application domain for a lot of people. Um, the problem is, and this is why business hasn't moved into this area, is that the people don't have a whole lot of money. Uh, and they don't have the capital to kind of put up, put behind, put behind, you know, buying, you know, buying products, right? So, the, the 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 unique kind of challenge as a designer in this space is that, you know, given these constraints, you have to think about, okay, can we develop some technology that people are going to be able to, you know, there's going to be some sustainable kind of business proposition behind the people who might, in the end, uh, be buying this technology. And the challenge is for a lot of these things in this application domain is that. Um, to be able to, because it is this really hard design space, this engineering design space. Um, you know, there there are a lot of times there is there is a lot of work that goes behind. You know, finding a technology which can actually satisfy satisfy this gap um, and 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 make some impact. And there are some organizations that kind of have have understood that and kind of gotten that. So Gates is, is one of them that you know understands like those initial phases in research. It's really, you know, you may you may get something which works. There's there's risk associated with it, and it's going to take a lot of work. And but then maybe maybe we can actually get something which which is going to be able to meet that price point, which then business will take up and and be able to be able to then um, be able to then uh, there would be some profitability there. And given the fact that there is this huge market that uh, that can contribute a small amount, um, that we can we can actually make it move the needle. Um, but I think there's this activation energy, this like initial kind of investment that a lot of times needs to be put in to be able to make it to this point that, you know, where there's the, where the business can kind of jump in and, and take that take that stage. Uh, and that's my own perspective is, you know, these, because these problems are so are are quite, you know, to get something which is going to work for this highly constrained design space, it's it's hard problems. Um, and, and and you know, you need that initial investment put in there so we can understand what's what's going on behind these hard problems. And then once that initial investment, you've got the ideas and you've got the, the, the technology kind of going, then then we can go and think about how can we build it into this, into this business approach. Well, thank you very much, Amy. Uh, I hope I articulated, I, there are obviously lots of questions um, that I wasn't able to synthesize, or maybe I didn't articulate the way that, that you were thinking about uh, when you were putting them in. 
Um, we do have this recorded, so you can go back and watch. I know there were some questions about looking at the slides or, or whatever, so that's going to be posted. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that you know people can find you and contact you. Sure, I think they definitely can. That's uh, your 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 contact information is public. But also we have these E4CU structures for for connecting with people, and I think. You know, one of the things we can think about, this was our first step at trying to connect more people in this space and create spaces where people can collaborate. A lot of people, Amy, were, were so inspired. They were like, I want to collaborate with Amy. How do we do that? Like, tell me how to do that. Oh, right? great. <laughs> so so you, may, you may get some more of those partnerships out of this. But um, That's great. I, think, I think in general, we want to we wanna find out, like, how do we connect the people that are in these organizations with with the practitioners or researchers, if it's a particularly research specific problem that's needed. Um, and so we'll be looking at those structures. So if you have ideas, please email me sure. or Anna, um, anybody that's out there that has like, hey, like it would be great if there was a directory that did this. We already have some directories of people working in the space. The GD research report, you can read that for North America and Australia and New Zealand, working on other ones. But um, I'm gonna let Yana take it away to sort of describe uh, other resources that exist. Um, but again, I just want to thank you, Amy. Obviously, uh, this seminar series was just my way to get to hear you talk, so I'm excited that it happened, um, and and really inspiring for me personally, but uh, and, and I assume for everybody else that's here. So thanks everyone for participating, for joining. Yana, uh, please take it away. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much, Jesse, and thank you again, Amy. I think I'm just going to build really quickly on the last question and to say that Ultimately, these issues are, are systemic issues that require an ecosystem perspective. So we can't think about engineering and engineering interventions in isolation of, of investment strategies, of, of government, um, uh, of roles in, in, in developing sustainable solutions. So um, our focus with Engineering for Change is to unpack uh, the, the system's view and, and really try to help engineers understand where they enter the system, how they influence and develop solutions, and uh, give them agency to do that from wherever they are, whether they're students uh, in the private sector, in, in the public sector, or uh, retired. It's, it's, you know, all of us have a role to play. I know we're at time, so I won't take much longer than that. I know there's a lot of questions that didn't get addressed. Uh, for those of you who are really interested in case studies and insights regarding some of the examples that Amy shared and beyond, those are documented on Engineering for Change, and please do reach out to us. I also want to give a shout out to our upcoming presenter uh, for the seminar in June, James Rajanayagam, who will be representing IIT Madras and talking about social entrepreneurship and sustainable development um, research uh, in India for, uh, for next month. So please join us for that. With that, if we didn't address your questions, if you know you want some more information, please reach out to us. Thank you again, Amy. Thank you, Jesse. It's been a really insightful seminar, and we're so thrilled to have you all of you join us. Enjoy the rest of your day. Stay safe. Wash those hands. Thank you. Bye bye, everyone. All right. Thanks, Jesse. Thanks, Yana. Thanks, Amy. Ciao. Ciao, everybody. Ciao.